Basically what I'm doing here is we're showing off just the arcane techniques and materials that that go into creating American comics. And I say American comics because I was just um, in Denmark not too long ago, and I'm astonished to find out that a lot of younger people don't even use paper anymore. It's purely Cintiq and, and Wacom tablet and all of that kind of... Uh, Kind of a thing. So I thought it would be a cool opportunity to show off some of the old technologies that kind of went into creating comics for the first, say, 100 years of uh, comic strips and comic books. So right now I'm using some colonial technology, uh, the, just the Crowquill dip pen, the Hunt 102, the dip pen of champions. Uh, used by guys like Robert Crumb and Jaime Hernandez, a couple of my favorites. I like the comics for me and drawing for me is something that encompasses like all of my senses, right? So so this ink has a particular smell to it. Visually, um as I as I put down these these pen strokes I'm watching almost like a fuse being lit. I'm watching the line dry up, you know, from like the earliest line I put down to the newest, almost like in a linear kind of stroke. It's really kind of cool to watch, and I, I like that. The ink has a smell, the, the feel of this paper, the tactility of the, the pen, the little scratching noise. That's all this stuff that I like, but the more pragmatic and useful stuff that's good about this this pen nib, for instance, is how you can get a lot of thick lines and thin lines with just this one utensil or apparatus or whatever you want to call it. Playing with Zipatone screens and Letraset press-on type, which was the computer font before the computer font came into existence. Uh, and uh, the Leroy lettering tool, which was used by, by EC Comics of the 1950s. This thing happens where when you get into comics and cartooning, it becomes this all-encompassing thing where once you learn to draw, then you want to you look at the work of like older masters, and then you see that they achieve certain lines and certain strokes and and uh, certain uh, production techniques that you just are that are so foreign to you, so you have to figure out how to reverse engineer their their methods so that you could achieve those kinds of lines or those kinds of uh, you know gray tones or whatever it may be in your work. So you you'll find that a lot of cartoonists are are uh, kind of experts of these old techniques and styles and a lot of us uh, compete with each other on eBay whenever um, a lot of letter set press on type comes up for bid or something like this. So everybody has a war chest uh, that they have of all sorts of antique ephemera and tools and things like this and actually to be honest um, I got a bunch of this letter set these letter set uh, vinyl letters and the guy who I won the auction from he must have he must have uh, googled my name or something and he read uh, my comics on boing boing and wrote me a whole long letter and I think I won an auction for like 10 pages worth of stuff and he sold I mean he sent me everything he had he was just like oh I read your comics it's really cool I'm not going to use this stuff like you'll put this to to better use and he, and he like gave me a whole box of stuff so that kind of like started my kind of collection of um, these old tools and I use them primarily for like commission work and stuff like this whenever I'm at a convention people really like to see you play around with that stuff because it's it's um you, you just have never seen it done before and it's one of those things where when you buy these old things off of auctions and stuff like it's some of the last stuff in existence like they don't make that stuff anymore so it's like 
it's almost like fine wine. If you're a design-oriented, illustration-oriented geek, which I'm unabashedly uh, proud to call myself. I've been at it for a very, very, very long time. Like, definitely since I was in grade school, for sure. Um, and just never quit. Like, before I got my first published gig, I definitely put together close to a thousand pages of inked, lettered comics. Um, so there's never been a moment in life where I thought I was going to be anything but a cartoonist. Uh, and I feel lucky about that. Like, I don't, I don't think that it's very freeing to kind of flounder in your early 20s or something like that, man, and, and not have a plan. Like, I have a lot of friends that way, and I, I don't see that uh, they're having a good time trying to figure things out. So I definitely feel lucky that I knew what I wanted to be and everything. Um, and that's what I mean about the all-encompassing thing. Like, if you just, like, look around here, like, you see an accumulation of 30 years worth of comic book buying and stuff. Like, I've never thrown anything out. And every time that I do, I always regret it because I, like, feel like I need it later. Like, I, I have a creative challenge that comes up and I know exactly what I could look at to help me. And then, you know, like the one or two things I ever got rid of, like, you know, the, the answers were there. So it's like, oh, I just have to keep it all now. <laughs> <laughs> but the main thing is it's super fun to me. You know, like I, I would not be doing this if it wasn't like a blast. Like there was this era where a lot of people were kind of down. Like they were, I don't know, like just kind of, making modeling kind of subject matter. And that's all good and everything, but I'm just trying to have a good time. I'm trying to have fun doing this stuff. Um, I like, I like guys like Robert Crumb, Dan Clowes. Right now I'm on a huge daily comics uh, kind of bender where I'm collecting all of these classic comic strips that have recently been reprinted. So even like Charles Schultz, Peanuts, um, Dick Tracy, all of these things. Because if you think about it, the comic strip has existed for about 50 years almost before the comic book was invented. Like we always think about it as just like, yeah, one, you know, comics, were, comic strips were first and then comic books came after. But comic strips were around for a really long time before comic books. And I like this idea of having... Uh, four democratic boxes to tell your story each day. And it's really interesting to see how these different masters of the form handle that, those same parameters, mm -hmm. you know? So, so uh, I want to work with the, those kinds of restrictions um, just, to, just as an ex exercise because a big part of like the cartooning thing for me is just, is just uh, knowledge gain. It's just, I'm a student. Um, so I want to just like work in those parameters and I really love checking out just the different approaches that people had guys like a guy like Chester Gold, the dude who did on um, the Dick Tr Tracy strip, he could tell three stories in four boxes each day. There'd be these subplots and all this kind of stuff. And, and still like, I, I feel like if I wanted to do something like that, I would completely have to just steal from him because I couldn't, I couldn't imagine how to accomplish that, but he, he did it beautifully and then Charles Schultz like he could choose the exact right moments to, to like of childhood that would like rip your guts out like that's a thing about peanuts because Charlie Brown and all that stuff that looks so cute on the surface or whatever but it's it's uh the entire strip is based on just cruelty and viciousness <laughs> and depression <laughs> and depression yeah for sure that that's a that's the thing I like about this strip a lot and and why it's not hyperbole when people call him like the greatest uh, comic strip artists, uh, you know, of all time or whatever, because he really created this system to uh, to make these characters like just ciphers for different components of his personality. De so depending on each day, you know, how he was feeling, like that would probably be like the character that he would explore to just like to j just, you know, explore facets of himself. And I don't even think that it was uh, I mean, I, I I can't say that I know that it wasn't uh, intentional on his part, but I can only assume that he was just 
kind of felt like he was going through the motions, but what the end result is something, an amazing body of work. Something I aspire to, uh, to accomplish. But, you know, it's, I have this theory that it takes you like 20 years to just get to be good enough to be published. And then it takes you like another 20 years to create your quote unquote masterpiece. That's why I don't have tattoos because I would have to um, design them. And the thing that I like, this thing that I'm drawing right now is the best thing I've ever drawn. But then I'm going to draw something else tonight and it'll render this kind of obsolete. So it's like, why would I want some old crusty stuff on me? <laughs> When your book comes out, well, I'll, I'll speak for myself. When my book comes out and I get my box, I will be depressed for at least a week. And I don't, it's just a postpartum kind of depression that I can't explain. And uh, it usually goes away pretty quick, but it's there and it's very real and it's very sad. And I can't explain it. And but when I talk to friends uh, uh, and mention that this goes on, uh, I know that I'm not alone. So there's some, you know, there's probably not enough money in uh, creating a psychological profile of cartoonists, but it's definitely some kind of common thread that a lot of people kind of share. And I, I wonder if it's like you're opening yourself up to be vulnerable in a certain way. And that's just like not something I'm accustomed to. Um, because, you know, you have this new thing out, so now you're being judged in a new way. I don't know, but that's the only part that I don't look forward to. That I'm a crusty old man. <laughs> yeah, I never felt, I, I've never been tested and, and, and made to feel old before. But, uh, yeah, it, they, they, they were like, yeah, man, this is, like, times have changed, man. Um... And but I identify like a lot of like there's a lot of problems that come with the stuff that I saw that them doing because they become victims of choice. And now that they have this like history button, like like if I screw something up, I basically get one more chance to fix it. I get to white it out and then I get one more chance. But when you try to put white out on top of ink that's on top of white out, watch what happens. Doesn't work. So uh you have to be choosy and you got to put down the lines the first time, basically. Um, and I saw these kids kind of just using the history button and going back and forth, back and forth and, and using million, you know, they have a coloring box, uh, a, a crayon box full of uh, uh, th three trillion colors. So I see them changing colors, just, you know, 5% increments and stuff like that. And it's like, I think that you really learn a lot by kind of working fast and um and doing a lot of things especially at the student stage when when it's not for print or something so so that's the way my workshops were set up so I had to harp on them like nah listen we we like speed is king while we're here together yeah this this is all just it's just I mean it's all in my motor responses now. Like, so whenever, I, when, like when I was in Denmark and I was still working, like I had to set things up, like at the inkwell, wherever I was, it had to be on a table exactly here. Mm -hmm. And then I had to have a th something here to catch it because it's just in my motor responses now to just psh, dab, dab, dab. Oops. Let me just fix that there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, man. If you're a pro... So it teaches you how to fix those mistakes. Yeah, yeah. See, I wasn't going to add a shadow, but you just add the shadow now. And I will use a brush at this point. But but comics really is a thing of, uh, it's all, it's a lot of choice making. Like every, every line you put down, you know, has some thought behind it. Unless you, uh, Dab a bunch of ink like I did that once. But you make it work. Yeah, so like I said, uh, a lot of cartoonists, once you hit a certain point, you, you get 
you de develop this um, this seduction of old print technology and old methods and materials that were used before, you know, used by your heroes um, before you know you you the compute invention of the computer and Adobe Photoshop and all that sort of thing. So like before computer fonts. Uh, if there was like some sort of typeface that was, you know, obviously not hand lettered on a cover, you had several options uh, to get that typography on there. And sometimes what uh, they would end up using would be these uh, vinyl letters that you would kind of burnish onto the page. And they come in, you know, wide assortments of point sizes and, and uh, typefaces. So we're going to use some of that on the piece that that I just drew for you. And you can see that there's all different kinds. There's even some of different colors and stuff like that. And let's see what else we have here. Then there are these kind of, well, there's a stuff called Zipatone that you have probably seen if you read, if you read manga, um, or just old comics and you notice like the little gray, the black dots that kind of form gray patterns. Uh, that was done with this uh, technology called Zipatone that, uh, that is basically, it's a sticker that you put over top of the art and you cut around it with an X-Acto blade and then you take it off and you press it down, cut the excess off and then you have a gray tone. Uh, so that is like the was is the pri like these gray tones are the primary kind of shade that's used but then if you take a look here there are all these other kinds of textures that you could apply like this pebble texture and and a wood panel texture this is the stuff that I I ordered like 10 sheets of this uh, and won it on eBay and the guy gave me his entire stock once he saw my comics on boing boing which I thought was very cool he said he went all digital Look at this brick wall thing. I always draw every brick. Um, some other zipatones that exist, like like if you wanted um, simple flat color on your art back in the day, you would have to use these clear sheets of these colored films, and you would cut them out, and you would place them down. Not on the original artwork. Your original artwork would be would be processed on like a transparency, so the black line art would be on you know, a piece of pla a plastic film that would go over top of the area that you color. Um, so it's sort of like a backwards thing. Um, so we'll use all of this stuff on our little happy mutant. So at first I'm gonna apply a gray tone to our, ha our happy mutant. And as you could see, I could see all line art, uh, you know, through this. And what I'll do is just cut around the areas that I kinda want to apply this to our guy. So I'll just cut a big swatch because I want most of them to be covered. And it's interesting stuff like this adhesive strip, like it's pretty durable, but you could still, you cut it with basically just the weight of the blade. Like you just let the blade kind of do all the work and you just kind of guide it with your hand as you pull it across. Um, so there's that. And then I'm not accustomed to really cutting out such a big strip, so hopefully I get it done, get it right in one, one, one try. And then comes the process of just cutting away the excess. And then you always just put the excess back just because it might be useful again at some point. So this is like Dom Perignon 1962 or something like that. What I'll do with a, with, uh, a lot of these is before I use them, I, I scan them in at a very high DPI 
just so that I could use the same kind of textures and stuff uh, digitally and try to my best to kind of create that same kind of imperfection because you can make these dot half tones in the computer, no doubt, but they're so precise and everything and that's not as interesting to me. I, I do call it a like a digital uncanny valley with like a lot of stuff because it's like there is a disconnection. There's a disconnection with uh, the color sometimes in the artwork where the color is just so precise. You know, when you have like a paint bucket fill color, but the art is kind of wobbly and organic. Like there's an incongruity to that that is very unattractive to me. Um, so I always have to like, when it comes to color, forget about it. Like that's, that's a whole nother kettle of fish. But there is something about these, when you use these legit screen tones that uh, it just, it, it looks different. Art Spiegelman just recently talked about, um, you know, during the, uh, Charlie Hebdo stuff, he was on Democracy Now! And, and I heard him say that uh, comics are not finished until they're in print. And, and I agree with that. And, and I think a part of what he means by that is how the stuff looks in print, but also how people react to it in print. Um, because it is, it's a different experience. Um, that's why I always kind of get a little skeptical whenever I see comic art on a gallery wall because it's like, you know, wasn't quite made for that. It's a completely different context. The dollar goes very far here, man. You could exist and be an artist and not have to have a day job in Pittsburgh. I endorse it, but I don't like to speak about it too loudly because I want it to stay affordable. Yeah, it's true. You know, it's funny, whenever I have my New York friends stay over or something and I, I want to take them out, uh, I want to take them to a cool place, but all they have in New York is cool places, so they want to go to, like, Eaton Park and a Cheesecake <laughs> Factory and stuff. Like, that's their idea of cool. Like, they want to go to Chili's. So, we'll illustrate... We'll describe him as a happy mutant using the the uh, the press on typography and all that you would do if you wanted to do it right you know what let's do it right so you would hit it with T square right. so when I line that paper up straight so that the letter forms just ain't floating around. So all that you do with these things, like you see I put like a little guideline and then you could just like line it up. So you kind of line up your letter form and then you just burnish it with some sort of implement and press it into the, uh, the paper. And then you could see when you could see when it adheres because the color of it is just different than the others. Ugh. And it did not adhere. <laughs> oh, there it is. Wow. I guess um, these were like mostly like architectural things as well. I don't quite know. A big part of this video is like, I think Mark Frauenfelder will think this is cool, you know, because he's like super down with all that old yeah. crap. So you see how these things start to... Yeah. We'll go, we'll go, uh, capital and lowercase. Oh, for sure. And even, even at this stage, like what I'm doing, uh, is still like, I mean, it was, I would say that was probably like close to obsolete even in the eighties, because what you would do is you would take, I see this one's not adhering. Uh, you would take, yeah, you would, <laughs> Got a weird thing on there. Uh, you would, if you had a lot of type typography, like on a magazine cover or something like that, you would go to a service bureau, and then they would, they would like develop the type onto a film, 
overlay, and and that would be that. <laughs> yeah, this is looking a little a little um, haggard, but yeah, Happy mutant. yeah, it is. It, when when you make a flaw like this, you just say that it's a design element for sure. I like your thinking, Heather, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, so you can imagine like when you're at a comic convention and people have never seen this stuff and you're like signing your name with these things, mm -hmm. it's kind of fascinating to them. There. A happy mutant. A little haggard. A little bit. Pretty much. I went to art school for a year, but it didn't do much for me. Uh, I learned a lot from the people that I went to class with, really. Um, just just watching them do stuff. And sometimes watching them do stuff wrong. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm going to make sure I don't do that. So what I'm using here, this is uh, called an Ames lettering guide, and it's an architectural tool. Um, just useful to, to have, you know, equally spaced lettering uh, when, when you sort of stack text and it's used for, uh, for comic book lettering, hand lettering. Uh, so I'll have, I'll have the character just, uh, you know, say something. So you, you use this, the guide sort of tells you which holes to use. And So if you take a look, it gives you these like perfectly uh, good guidelines. To, uh, from from my lettering, I used to I like to use the the micron number five. Is it just the perfect? For for the size of my brackets, it's it's the perfect size for that for sure. Yeah, but if you if I increase the point size of of the handwriting, I would use something thicker. Um, but the micron, it only comes, the, the thickest size is like uh, the, the 8, I believe. And when I talk to students about this stuff, I, I describe it, it's like driving, where, you know, when you spend enough time driving... A car, like it's like impossible to even imagine driving on the wrong side of the road or in a different lane. Like, I cannot push beyond the bounds of the lettering, like the the guidelines. And then when I put my balloons down, I have just like this like endless supply of these templates that I use for just creating my lettering balloons. Yeah, I know you always like to be quiet when you're lettering. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, uh, you know, certainly um, this is not too big of a deal, but whenever I'm lettering like an avalanche of text, uh, if I listen to music or something, like the lyrics that I'm listening to inevitably do end up in what I'm writing and I screw up and then that's another part that Photoshop plays in my creative process because I could just cross a word out and then use a different T that I used in a different letter and change things. Uh, and I also change the space of the letters like inside the balloon to just kind of make things a little bit more oriented better. So a lot of Photoshop work when it comes to lettering, but the, the, the basic structure, it's all, it's all by hand, like so. So what we're going to do right here is add a little Leroy lettering, like using this, this kit to apply the text. Um, and 
this kit is the way you accomplish this very kind of mechanical um, type typeface that you saw that you would see in these 1950s EC comics. Most famously, Tales from the Crypt um, was their most popular effort. So you see, it's like this like mechanical kind of dead kind of text. Like there's definitely a very clear reason why you don't see this come up very much. But this like when you when you do use this, it immediately invokes this like 1950s aesthetic. And I do use it. Um, I used it on the cover here um, because I wanted to have this this very uh, old 1950s kind of style because this cover design actually let me show you because sampling and and stealing from my creative elders is a big part of my process and on one of these yeah I basically I stole from this cover to get to get this cover um, and I wanted to keep that sensibility so if you were to like look in here same lettering cool what we have here Leroy lettering set uh, in a very classy kind of case for sure um, so you have these different these are your different point sizes for the size of the lettering that you want, as you could see. And it looks italic, but the way the this apparatus is constructed, um, it could give you italics or straight up and down letters, depending on how you arrange things. So I'm gonna use I'm gonna use like this size. Whatever, whatever this is. It looks nice. Then you need this stylus, like this, this thing has, you'll see, I'll show you. I have to get the ink into here. When you fill it up with ink and you keep it off of the paper, like the ink will sit in there, but every time you, you press down and see, I have to get it in there better, but every time you press down onto the paper, it'll push this piece up. It'll push this piece up and then the ink will, just enough ink will get on the page, like. You might want to cut that for a sec, because I gotta... Okay, there it is, I got it. Cool. And it might be a little extra thick now that I look at it, but we'll try it. Oh, that's very bold. Oh, that definitely ain't gonna work with that size. We're gonna have to go smaller and get messy. God damn, I got it in there good. All right, so what you do to use the Leroy lettering system requires your T-square, requires your paper to be aligned it requires your T-square to situate your letters. Then you take this tool and you keep this stylus within this ridge here. And then this stylus here uh, traces the letter forms because these are all kind of embossed. And then this one part of this from me is what will draw the actual the actual character. So I'm gonna have the classic EC Comics uh, climactic <clears throat> exclamation. Uh, I will have I'll, I'll just I'll letter that for. And it's a trick too because you have to keep this T square and everything completely still, and then you have to eyeball the spacing between the letter forms to get that right. Like, see, I totally didn't get that right. Wow. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> 
That's pretty good. And if you remember those pages I showed you, there would be 400 words on a page or something, oh my God. you know, like, like, you know, 11 lines of text sometimes using this apparatus to, to accomplish all of that. Like, I, I couldn't imagine. There are some, some, uh, some points where, where like maybe the computer is a better way to go because that ain't, that ain't doing it for me. You would uh, read interviews with, with uh, a lot of the people that you like. So I would seek out issues of the Comics Journal or Wizard Magazine where they would talk about this stuff. And then I was never able to find a place in Pittsburgh that had it. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, eBay and, and places like that. Probably even when I was a kid, it was probably too expensive. Uh, they were real cool, and they, they never um, discouraged me. And, that, and that's, I, th I feel like that's the best you could hope for, man, is just, like, don't, to, to not have parents, like, uh, you know, get in your way. Because I, I know that a lot of people, um, that wasn't their parents' reaction, you know. Um, and in fact, they, like, my folks, they, they put me in some cool art programs and stuff once they, once they discovered them. So, uh, yeah, it's very good. Very good, I do feel lucky about that. And you see like the blacks are kind of uneven. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you would print this, the blacks will show up pristine. Mm -hmm. I like to see the brush strokes and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I was talking about those uh, IDW artist edition books that uh, there, there are some of them that are actually I don't like so much because the artist was so kind of anal retentive or something that, um, that the art looks like Xeroxes. You know, you, you see, you see no hand in it because they were so precise in their mark making and everything, like down to the 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 black line, like of like a pull of black. There there are like these documentaries of cartoonists, like like there's the Tezuka one and there's one on Air J and stuff, and they're such rare morsels, man. But to see those guys put pencil to paper, it's like, damn, that's so cool. Because you know they put these these definite strokes down and and it's just like they like they see it um without you know without a being before it hits the paper they just see it they put down these marks and that's what I'm chasing man like I'm I hope to get there in a couple decades for sure but you know you don't think that far ahead Well, you know, you wanna know what's funny is in the nineties, man, uh in the late nineties, like I graduated in the year two thousand and at my high school they were still teaching us word perfect on those nineteen eighty four Macintoshes. Like I like in like nineteen ninety eight. Because we still had a Rizograph when I was in high school. Mm. Which was just like what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> we didn't use it often. But... You know you know it's so funny because that's a highly coveted item in DIY comics right now. The Rizograph machine. Like everybody, because you could get really interesting inks and you could do multi passes so you could have s several colors and like all this stuff. Like, that's what a lot of my friends are printing on right now when they do like editions of like 200 or whatever. It's funny though, is that uh, if you look at my pages, my original art. Um, I do just paint bucket fill the blacks for for just speed. Yeah, it, it just it, 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 you know it's just time consuming.